South Bronx district of New York, the king of Latin music, Tito Puente, is playing for his people. They call him the high priest of salsa music. Tito Puente and his band are playing on a weekday afternoon in New York's poorest district. Music, he says, keeps the Puerto Rican alive. No one's paying Puente today. Music is his social work. He's joined by pianist Charlie Palmieri. Puerto Rican parents in the ghettos of New York was Felipe Luciano. Here in New York City, in the main, we have we're um, concentrated mainly in the service industries. We are dishwashers, we are doormen, we are assistant dishwashers, we are street cleaners, we are whatever the lowest um, on the totem pole is in terms of the service field area is what we are in the main, the working class. We have an increasingly large and visible middle class. But that middle class still is caught up in trying to make its money and mind its own business. Um, in fact, we have that middle class going through what I call cultural amnesia. If they can forget their Puerto Rican, it would be much better. They can then live their lives and call themselves Hispanic and not, never have to worry about that term Puerto Rican. But in the main, we are a working class and very poor community, a very large 
um, poor underclass. It's a miserable feeling walking into a school, for example, and feeling the total sense of worthlessness of Puerto Rican children. Feel, and these are beautiful, this is a beautiful people. Um, the people I'm talking about come from all races. They are black, they are brown, they are white, they are, they are beige, they are the colors of the rainbow. We are a, a, a people who love music. We are people who have an acute sense of hearing. We like, we, we for example, our, our rhythm is so complex that a lot of people really can't understand it. Here in the United States of America, we have a history of having closely knit families, though that's rapidly uh, undergoing a, a real transformation because of the urban um, decay that we see here. We have so many beautiful qualities that it's very difficult to show. Um, it's very difficult for our own folks to see it. It's, it's, it's like trying to remove the layers of filth that, has been, that have been put in front of their faces. And so that, I feel, has always been my job. How can we remove the veil? How can we take the stereotypes away from my own people's eyes so that they can see their own beauty. Felipe tried to activate the Puerto Rican community back in the 60s by forming a gang dedicated to improving the life of his people by peaceful or violent means. He called it the Young Lords Gang and became its leader. The most important contribution that the young lords made to the consciousness of Puerto Rican struggle here in the United States was that for the first time the Puerto Rican community actually saw their sons and daughters fighting a system back fighting them back culturally in what we taught in what we sang in what we wore fighting them back politically we did not believe that the system of government that we live under capitalism was sufficient for our needs and fighting them back physically we would not allow policemen to come into our community and mercilessly beat um, people up. That is, we were not going to be victims any longer. And that was the message that spread like wildfire throughout the community. For the first time, you had old ladies, old men. It was, it's an incredible sight actually seeing the elders coming out to embrace um, a group of their sons and daughters, who formerly they criticized for just hanging out, for having no ambition, no vision, no sense of where they were going. They're embracing these children now, and they're saying, you are our liberators. That was the most important role and the most important contribution that we made to the political consciousness here. It wasn't material. You could not see it. You could just see it in the erectness of the carriage, in the way people talked about themselves, in the way Puerto Ricans began to put themselves on the map. Up till then, all that was known of Puerto Rican culture to outsiders was the Latin music of the New York nightclubs and Hollywood movies. In reality, this music had migrated to America with workers from Cuba and Puerto Rico. The Caribbean island of Puerto Rico had been desperately poor. Centuries ago, it was colonized by Spain, and then, at the turn of the century, the Americans moved in, and Puerto Rico became part of the American Commonwealth. That presented the slum dwellers of districts like La Perla with the chance to migrate to the city of New York with dreams of riches they could never otherwise attain. They left the islands in their thousands for a better life. What they found were districts like the South Bronx, where Puerto Rican workers settled and raised families. Those whom God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Joe Conzo and Laura are marrying in the South Bronx today. The band leader, Tito Puente, is Joe's best man. Being a father of the community, the wedding would not be complete without him. That you may find delight in each other and grow in holy love until your life's end. May you dwell in God's presence forever. May true and constant love preserve you. I give you this ring. I give you this ring as a sign of my love and faithfulness. A sign of my love and faithfulness. Okay.
Like other Latin workers, musicians can't afford to turn down any opportunity. So after the wedding, Tito and his band will be off to another gig. Puerto Ricans take a great pride in their racial mixture, mostly black with Spanish, but with a bit of almost everything else thrown in. The community retained its own identity as it grew, largely through its music. Jamming with Tito Puente is drummer Ray Barreto. are the largest part of what New Yorkers call their Hispanic community. There are two million, uh, and that is what the city tells us, two million Hispanics in the city. Now, in a city of eight million people, that means we are a quarter of the city's population. That is not to bring in the question of illegal aliens. If we brought in the whole point about illegal aliens, I can convince you, I can assure you, that there are at least in this city three and a half million Hispanics, in it, which means we are the dominant majority we are the largest ethnic group in this city. But, of course, census takers, official census takers, who, by the way, do not go into the homes and actually, literally take down each member of the family, and who Spanish-speaking people do not trust anyway to give them correct information, so they never get it. But we know, I know a million Puerto Ricans myself. How can there be a million Puerto Ricans here in New York? So I know that that has been done purposely to keep us from understanding our own power and our own sense of worth. Um, I am convinced that we are oppressed, yes. Uh, and that is a result of our own, our own sense of victimization. Once we remove that, and once our consciousness r rises a little, that is, once we begin to understand that it is we who can stop the city at any point we want, we who can elect the mayor, we who can redress our own grievances. It's just a question of the slave breaking his own shackles that are not only on his hands, but are more on his mind. If we can get those shackles removed from his mind, the Puerto Rican in this city, the Hispanic, will be a powerful force to be reckoned with. One of the first instruments that man ever had in his hands was a pair of sticks. I don't blame the United States or the New York City public school system for making sure that our children don't understand the music. It's not their job to do that. Their job is to make our kids automatons, to fit their system, their aesthetic, their way of doing things. It's left to musicians like Charlie Palmieri to educate Puerto Rican children in their own culture. He gives music lessons after hours in a South Bronx school to preserve their links with the past. They played as an instrument because this was hung on a cow. And when they wanted to know in the field, the farmer wanted to know in the field where his cow was, he listened to the sound of the bell. Now the bomba, the plena, and the danza are rhythms of Puerto Rico. They come from that particular island. And then from Cuba, they have a whole stack of rhythms. And Cuba has the la rumba, as La Guaracha, as the Mambo, as Cha Cha Cha, it has Son Montuno, it has Son, and we just gonna have to pick one of them out. Let's pick out uh, a rumba. It's an old fashioned rumba. We're here really to get together to learn a word that's been used quite a lot. And the word is salsa. Does anybody know what the word salsa means? Anybody? No, you don't know what salsa means? You mean to tell me when your mother starts cooking and she makes, and she, ma and she makes a thin salsa? You don't know what that is? It's sauce, right? But they have bands that play it with modern harmony and they play it really together. And they use electrical instruments now, they use electric pianos. So they give it a terminology, and the terminology is called 
salsa. Okay, let's try this. One, two, one, two, three, four, go! I gotta record this. Okay, now we're gonna do it again. Okay, we're gonna do a little mambo. All right, we're gonna do a little. We're gonna do a little number that I wrote a long time ago, Mambo Show, and this is this is how it's gonna sound. Are you ready? I hope you are. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? One, two. One, two, three, four. <laughs> salsa music. <laughs> salsa superstar Celia Cruz is rehearsing with her band. To Puerto Ricans, she's a legend. She's seldom seen in public, but on disc, her music sells second to none. She sings about the black roots and rhythms of her music. Celia is Salsa's only female star. The Latin music business is still dominated by a macho male mentality, which says that Latin women, apart from Celia, can't sing. Latin women are fine singers, but in comparison with American girls, they are very badly paid. We can't expect to be like Donna Summer in Las Vegas with a full house every night because Latin people have to go to work during the week and can only afford to go to nightclubs at weekends. So they earn less. But Latin women are fine singers, great singers, and anyone who doesn't think so just doesn't know what he's talking about. Her song says, if a man's good to a woman, she'll be good to him. But if he's bad, she'll give him nothing. And if he treats her like a slave, she'll go. Some Puerto Ricans, the smooth sounds of commercial salsa are too far removed from the lives and problems of the community itself. The music is used and manipulated, consciously and unconsciously. Not, there's no great conspiracy to do this. What happens is that almost insidiously, the music takes on a status quo role, a pacifist role, a diffusing role. 
it takes away from having people look at the reality of their own lives, at the shit encrusted walls that they have to work within all of the time. The headquarters of the salsa music industry is Fania Records. It's a multi-million dollar business run not by a Puerto Rican, but an Italian American, Jerry Masucci. Having built the company up from nothing, he's very much a power behind the scenes. As long as I have the hits and the artists, I'm in a powerful position. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's like a baseball team, you know. If you're a winning manager, and uh, you're powerful, but once the team starts losing, you're only as good as your players, you know. I mean, I can't go and make the music. I can tell them what I like, I can tell them what's selling, I can tell them my ideas and, uh, you know, combine the commercial aspects and the the uh, musical aspect. But I was, I've been lucky enough to know the right talent and sign them and uh, keep them. And, uh, you know, and after 15 years in the business and bringing the business up from nothing, you get a certain amount of power. Fania Records' power was built by flooding the market with a successful formula, bland lyrics with a smooth Latin rhythm, the salsa sound. But against all odds, one of Fania's top stars is combining commercial salsa with a message important to the Latin American people. <laughs> Ruben Blades is rehearsing a new album with uncompromising lyrics about the political prisoners of Latin America, the sadness of men deprived of liberty, the violence of fascism. <laughs> make our lyrics speak of what I call first dimensional reality for our people. Can our lyrics make sense? We're not asking for leftist lyrics, we're not as asking for people to become Marxist Leninists, we're only saying to our composers and to our arrangers and to our lyricists, our sons and daughters are listening to this music. Can we say something about the, kinds of, the kind of life that they're leading, about what the options are or the lack of options? Can you do that? Um, Ruben Blades is doing that. Um, there are others who are trying to achieve that, but they're fighting an uphill battle. And it's up to the community to, to buy the records, of course, and to make that happen. The irony of all of, all of this is, is that still the company makes money. <laughs> I think that for too long this business has been run like, by people who don't really understand the public. You know? um, they always felt that the less you said, the better you will be off. In other words, don't get too deep and people don't understand that they don't want to be bothered by it uh, do it nicely softly you know just go along they don't they it's gonna be all right and uh, also a lot of people and I'm sorry to say this uh, are not too creative you know you fall into a pattern that works and you stay there it's comfortable you don't want to make any waves you know, why, what for you know and um, that's one of the reasons, as a matter of fact, be of why I got involved in this, in this, uh, in, in this music, uh, salsa music. Salsa is like an international ur urban folklore. You know? 
Salsa is the folklore of the city. But not of one city, but of all cities in Latin America. And uh, there's so many themes, you know, there's so many th things and situations and everything that can be sung and should be sung. Instead of, you know, just talking two or three things, you know, and, and it's always the same themes and very short. It's the same thing. And that, that's one of the reasons I got involved in this. I said, this is enough of this crap, you know. Can you give me an example on the guitar of the kind of thing you can Well, when I got to New York, for instance, I, I wrote this song. Apúrate, maquinista, que de hace tiempo estoy esperando el número seis. El número seis. El número seis. What is that song about? It's a subway. Hurry up, damn machine. I've been here for hours and still I cannot see the number six subway. Number six. And it's something that, you know, that song, for instance, I wrote that song five years ago. People still sing it today. Why? Because today you still have people waiting for the number six train and saying, where the hell is this train? You know? Uh, songs like Pablo Pueblo. Uh, regreso un hombre en silencio de su trabajo cansado. Su paso no lleva prisa. Su sombra nunca le alcanza. Espera el barrio de siempre con el farol en la esquina. Con la basura ya enfrente y el ruido de la cantina. This is a man returns. He walks very slowly. So slowly that his shadow is always behind him. And he's, in, he's not in a hurry. He knows what's, a, what's a waiting for. The same neighborhood, old neighborhood, with the same corner with the same uh, trash cans overturned, the same noise from the bar. About the same number of Puerto Ricans live on their island as live in New York, around three million. The slum dwellers of La Perla still live beneath the walls of the old Spanish castle. Spain was the colonial power that gave a distinctive sound to the black music a distinctive appearance to the people. But at the turn of the century, America invaded, and Puerto Rico became part of the American Commonwealth, neither a state nor independent. Over the past 25 years, a new middle class has evolved from the dollars America poured in, attempting to keep the island politically in line. Caribbean islands like Puerto Rico and Cuba grew up as holiday resorts and gambling centers for Americans who built up chains of hotels and casinos for their own pleasure while they listened to the latest in Latin music. Today, the island is still a holiday maker's paradise. Hotels like the Condado Hilton like to give their customers what they want. <laughs> the cowboys are Puerto Rican waiters. to the swamping of their culture, many Puerto Ricans are calling for independence from American domination. <laughs> On an historic occasion, four Puerto Rican independence fighters have been released from jail by President Carter. 
long live Puerto Rico, and down with treason. Freedom, yes, Yankees, no. The freedom fighters just arrived in Puerto Rico from prison in the US. Victor Colazzo had shot at President Truman in 1950. Blair House, President Truman's temporary Washington residence, naturally drew crowds of people as soon as word of the attempt on his life was announced. The whole civilized world was shocked by the news. Here's a first-hand account of the affair from Secret Service Chief Victor Borman. A definite plot to assassinate the President of the United States was foiled today. Floyd, you were on the spot. You shot one of these assassins. Tell me just what happened. One of the men went by our post on the east side of the Blair House, Chief. And when he was about 10 feet away from Officer Birdzell, he pulled his gun and started shooting at the officer. Officer Davidson and I immediately pulled our guns and started shooting. Press photos show Oscar Colazzo. Colazzo was jailed for 29 years. His three companions, including a woman, Lolita Lebron, had fired pistols into the U.S. House of Representatives. They were jailed for 25 years. Lolita Lebron. Oh, pueblo mío, cuánta dicha de haber venido. People of Puerto Rico, my people, how wonderful it is to be back home after so many hardships. The flag I hold in my hand, it is up to all of you to see it is never torn down, eliminated or rejected. This flag which today is inferior to any other in the world. A young band dedicated to the Puerto Rican call for independence were invited to greet the heroes. Moliendo Vidrio. In Puerto Rico, politics and music go hand in hand. string guitar, called the Cuatro, is a musical symbol of Puerto Rican independence. It's unique to the island. Their song says, the Puerto Rican will not be downcast, even though she has no home to love, since our island is not really her own. Moliendo Vidrio's lyrics have not found favor with the Puerto Rican establishment. Just as many years earlier, the danzas of Rafael Hernandez had their references to independence removed. Today, they're safely performed on stage at the local Holiday Inn with no lyrics at all. Also traditionally Puerto Rican is the sport of cockfighting. The fights nowadays take place in the rarefied, air-conditioned ring beside the big hotels. But this is a Puerto Rican national sport, and passions run as deep as ever, even if they're paid for in American dollars. <laughs>
Much in Puerto Rico appears to be American. Tax-free businesses and low wages for workers make it a haven for the multinationals. But behind this facade of short-term foreign investment, some Puerto Rican traditions do survive. One of the island's earliest music forms is the plena, a local story in song. This one is about an American who thought a Puerto Rican fish was his friend. Instead, it attacked him and ate him up. Maybe it came from Cuba, the song suggests. roots in the black township of Luisa Aldea on the coast of Puerto Rico. A large slave settlement, it was once the home of Puerto Rican black music. Today in Luisa Aldea's central square, the Christianity of the Spanish and American colonizers continues converting people in revivalist meetings. But behind this facade too is a different reality a more far-reaching link with the past. Nor is the graveyard imagery all it seems to be. It appears, like the statues in many little shops, to be of Christian saints and historical characters. Master figures belong to Santeria, the religion of the black slaves from Africa. When they were forced to worship the church icons of Christianity, they used them as symbols for their own African gods of the air, the sea, and the wind. The most unlikely symbolic imagery evolved. looks back to Africa. Not just the rhythms, but also the words of Santeria are from the Yoruba tribe of West Africa. A secret summoning of African spirits for 400 years disguised behind Christian saints. level, the bomba dance of the African plantation slaves takes its place as a tourist show in a holiday inn. It's about the violent death of a slave girl at the hands of her white owner.
it's an example of the schizophrenia of modern Puerto Rico that while performing for American tourists, the dancers become increasingly hypnotically possessed by the bomba rhythms which were at the root of their culture. Bomba rhythms came to New York with modern salsa. Today, some musicians are committed to exploring the music of their past in a new idiom. Well, this, uh, unlike the commercial band, this is, it's got uh, different possibilities. When you play something commercial, you already are very, uh, 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 you are tied with the, how do you say, uh, estás atado. Uh, yeah, you are tied up. You are tied up with certain structures, you know, that you, ha you can't uh, really break them. They have to be very, like, for example, say disco music. It's a music that's got that structure. You can go out, you can't create on that. It's impossible. This music has got rhythms that are Salsa, for example, is timeless. These rhythms are modern now, will be modern in 100 years from now. This one change belongs to a culture. It's actually a language. Every time, uh, in fact, we that's the way, that's the way I play. I play mm -hmm. through language. But every time I play a rhythm or whatever, and I see somebody standing over there, and he's not moving, and you know, I want to make a move, you know? And I go, there's something that I know that he can move, you know? And then I go, bop, and Beautiful, yeah. It's a language all together. <laughs> has been able to adjust from a country rhythm, which was slower, to an urban-paced music. It's been able to survive that. Our music now is faster than it was 40 years ago. It's not the same rhythm. If you compare the, the clave, the rhythmic pulse of the 40s to the clave of the 70s, it's almost double the time. It's adjusted to cars, airplanes, speed of sound, speed of light, that kind of thing. Who knows, the 80s may have an even faster clave. But the point is, is that it's the street music that survives, the music of the people, because it is the conscience of the people. And that basically is what salsa is. Many see in salsa not just the music of the streets, but of big business in the discos. For young new Ricans, a Saturday night on the dance floors of a Latin club will mean forgetting the drudgery of their working week. Yeah. 
Here in New York City, we are um, among the most oppressed group. You've seen the dancers, um, you have seen the, the rhythm makers, but that belies what the political reality is, which is that those same people have to laugh to keep from crying. Every one of the musicians that you see is also very much a traditional music person. There's not one musician playing conga, playing trumpet, um, Puerto Rican or Cuban or Hispanic who does not understand what the roots of his culture are. Not one. And that is something I'm very proud of. You will see other musicians in other cultures, and this is not to criticize them, it's just to show the extent of colonialism, who have totally had their roots almost ripped out of their brains. If you can see a giant claw going into the cranium and just lifting out the, the racial unconscious of a people, at least here on the streets of New York, they can feel African rhythms. They can see where the Indians have had an impact on our culture. They can see the mixture of those cultures. And I think that our music will be the music of the Americas. It is the music of the 80s and 90s. It will take an enormous amount of struggle on our part to make that happen. <laughs> music will always survive. It is the music that transcends generations. African rhythms, street rhythms, that is what's survived because it has the intensity, the energy, the music of the barrios, because there just are more street people. They are more poor people. Also, the music, while still not having the lyrics that we would like, has the intensity, the rhythmic intensity that keeps our people moving. The music that we're talking about is a double-edged sword. It is escapist, it is trendy, it is faddish, but it also is innovative, it also is dynamic, it also is progressive. What determines what will live and what won't is the politics of a people and their experiences, what they go through. That is what determines whether the music will live or die. Oh! 